Hello, and welcome to Draw With Me. I'm Danny Gregory, and it's time to do some drawing, as we do every Thursday, and have done for almost 257 years now, or at least half the time that I've been locked in this box here in Phoenix, Arizona, a box that has just turned into a convection oven, because today it's going up to 150. 14 American degrees here in the desert. So, even with the air conditioning, it is still a hellhole. But I will try to avoid perspiring too heavily. And today we are going to do some exciting things, and we're going to do them with a very unexciting implement, which is the humble ballpoint pen. And we're going to be joined by my friend Gigi Chen, who is perhaps not familiar to all of you because she is new to sketchbook school as an instructor, but she is fantastic and you're gonna enjoy meeting her in a minute. And meanwhile, she is lurking in the green room, as we call it. It's not really a green room, it's not even really a room. It's not green. There are no like M&Ms or bottles of champagne or any of that kind of stuff. But anyway, there are lots of you all joining me, uh, including Timmy Carapides, Lalita Ma. Maheshwari from Albuquerque, and uh, Raj Shakar Shi. I'm just going to read people with interesting names today. Bhakti Deepak, Lalita Mashawari, and uh, Hurdy Gurdy One. So lots of other folks, uh, Renata and Jeannie, and of course, Thistle, you know who. So I'm glad you're all joining me here today in preparation for today's exercise. I would recommend strongly that you do two things. One, acquire a ballpoint pen. I have, in fact, I have lots of ballpoint pens. And uh, 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 so I have lots of ballpoint pens. Hopefully, you'll have at least one. It's a ballpoint pen, people. You must have one. So get a ballpoint pen. And then we're going to be drawing birds today because we are celebrating Ballpoint Birds, which is our upcoming workshop. And so get a bird or get a memory of a bird or get a picture of a bird. I will be using, where's the bird that I'll be using? Um, I'm going to be drawing a hummingbird. Why? Because they are beautiful. And we have a bunch of them here in our garden. They're vicious beasts. They're super territorial. They're constantly fighting, attacking each other, sucking all the stuff out of our various flowers. But they are beautiful. They are the fastest things you've ever seen. If you've never seen a hummingbird, I, and I hadn't until about five years ago, when you see one live, you can't really believe that it's an actual animal. It seems to be like some kind of a weird drone hyper-powered drone. It just doesn't behave like a normal bird. <laughs> then it disappears. So that's what I'll be drawing. It's also relatively simple shape and has amazing colors. So get your ballpoint pens, get your photo reference. Um, Morgan, I think we were going to post this, right? So um, Morgan will give you a link and so I'll, you can download this particular one, but don't. Go and get your own damn bird. There's a lot of them out there, and pick one that means something to you. This guy means a bit to me, um, so find one. If you live in rural Scotland, you don't need to be drawing hummingbirds. Draw grouse or something like that. Draw something that means something to you. All right. So here we go. So let me bring on Gigi. Um, Gigi, Hi. She, there she is, Gigi Chen. 
Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you. You are you are uh, looking sunny and bright, and uh, energetic. So, um, where are you right now? Oh, I'm in Harlem. I'm in New York City. I'm in my apartment, you just are. like everyone else should be, right? It's true. It's true. And what has your experience been like of the last few months? Have you had a good uh, time? It's been weird. New York City got hit pretty hard, you know. Um, we have gotten a lot better here since since April, but it's still it's difficult. And as an artist, it's been challenging, much more challenging than I expected it to be, because we all dream of having endless free time, but it's not it's not the same as <laughs> it's not really the same as what you think it's going to be. Yeah, because I would think you go to the yeah. studio, you work all day, you go home, you you know, you drink wine in cafes, you do whatever it is yeah, that artists life, do. You know, yeah. the commuting and the routine. And actually what's been really great is um, getting ready for this ballpoint pen workshop that's happening on July 18th and 19th. Thank you for my uh, has, yes. Yeah, <laughs> has been, it's been sort of keeping me, having meetings with you guys have really kind of given me a routine. Like it's given me something to uh, work, work towards, you know? Um, otherwise it's been really hard. I, I'm a person who usually works a lot. I love, I draw all the time. I fill sketchbooks, like, like, like whatever, you know, but this has been very difficult. Not, not what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to spend every day here working and that just isn't really a thing. You know, no, it's difficult. I think we all feel, we all feel like you do that. We have no excuse, but to be super productive because Hey, you know, we've got all this free time and uh, we don't have to go anywhere, but it's true. I mean, the world weighs on us. Yeah. You know, the free time is, I mean, free is, you know, it's relative, right? Like if you're, it's not free time if that's the only time you have, really, I guess. You know, I think for me, I'm used to working a lot. I'm used to working a lot on my own, but without a balance. And I have a part-time job. I can't go to my part-time job. And I'm not going to my studio uh, because my studio partners are older and I don't want to, you know, you know, endanger them. So I'm here most of the time. But it's been, been, you know, it's going back and forth between a really great day and really bad days. But I try. I have work to do. You know, I have a, a commissions, which I'm very lucky. But otherwise, it is uh, learning how to rebalance my life has been the most challenging. Right. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. Let's talk about happier times or less yeah. confusing times. So the yeah. last time I saw you was just um, after your show had opened. Um, in the village, not far from my house, you had a show of beautiful bird paintings. Tell us a bit about that show that you did. Oh, we're so lucky. It was at the Stone Sparrow Gallery in the West Village in Manhattan, and it was my dream show. It's such a gorgeous gallery, and it had only been open for about a year, and I, they offered me a show, and I did, oh, I made, I made so many paintings for them in a short amount of time, and I was super lucky. It was in February. <laughs> And the, of course, I mean, the timing of that for me was so fortunate and it really was a dream show. I got to have everybody show up and I got to have this one beautiful party because art shows always feels like it's my birthday. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was really wonderful. And what, was, know, the theme, what I, was the theme of your show? I mean, I know what uh, it was, but you tell oh, us. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. I, I work, I'm working on this series about this bird called the Bower Bird, B-O-W-E-R. It's a very special bird. It lives in Australia, New Guinea, and in order to catch a mate, the male bird collects a lot of little objects like bottle caps, uh, just little berries, and creates these like beautiful structures called bowers. And he sings and he dances. And if the female bird likes what she sees, they mate. And but I love how this story is the story of an artist. You know, he does all of these, collects all these things, and really fights for fights for love. Like he makes all these beautiful things and he just hopes to find a little bit of approval. And I, I find that story to be very personal for me and also for every creative person. We right. make and we make and we make and we hope, we hope to get that show. But we also just hope for someone to look at what we do, right? So it's not just about getting, getting the big show, which is just fortunate, but finding a little bit of love and happiness as you make it. And I think that during this time, I think about that work a lot and I, I'm still trying to make that work here because it really is in the end it's like fighting fighting for what you actually believe in. You know, and this is a really 
interesting time to think about that and recreate that and also just reframe it for ourselves. Yeah. No, that's, that, those are beautiful sentiments. I mean, I've talked to you about this Bowerbird show before because the Bowerbird has always meant a lot to me too because the Bowerbird to me is also just a sign of how essential creativity is for all creatures really and how sometimes you'll, you know, we as human beings tend to think that we are the ones who are capable of making art. And actually, we don't even think that. We think that a very small number of us are capable of making art. But the reality is that, as the Bowerbird shows us, that making beautiful things, creating things out of things that already exist, expressing yourself to the world, those are all like very basic, natural things that so many creatures do. And, and that we can embrace it in ourselves. We can say, you know what? I don't have, I mean, I, I don't have to uh, pigeonhole myself. I don't have to categorize myself by saying I'm not creative or I didn't go to art school. I don't know how to do these things. Look at, this is a little tiny bird and it's doing it. Why can't I? That's yeah, that's part of the lesson that I take from it too. Yeah, I mean, it's instinctual and the bower bird is really one of the few birds that has like, in a lot of ways, aesthetic taste. But I mean, every, but every, every animal has a taste. Every animal is looking for something very specific and, 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 and and as humans, like it's all individual, one person to the next, right? And that's what makes us kind of special. And even making art, I mean, we all make marks differently from each other, right. like all of us. Right. You know, even if we're trying to copy someone, we're all making work completely on our own terms, you know? Exactly. So I see a little bit of confusion because of my rainbow waterfall of pens. <laughs> you don't need a waterfall of pens for no, GD's, GD's workshop. In fact, there's really not much you will be able to do with them because you will be spending a, most of the workshop working with one black pen and then you will be adding one blue pen. And I think you'll probably need a pencil maybe, an eraser. But sure, so. sure. And you don't have to use the black and blue. You can pick any two combinations that you feel like. I love using pink and purple also, and that's also a really nice combination. As long as the, the colors work really nicely together, right. you know? So, you know, I mean, if you guys you know do the workshop, honestly, you can you know, look at for what it is and see what feels right and more fun for you. Right, exactly. It's, I mean, in the end, we are all going to be working from two models, um, two birds that we'll be uh, drawing. So we'll all be drawing the same birds, but certainly you wouldn't um, have a, you wouldn't worry that people would be going off on their own tangents and expressing themselves. I assume that that's perfectly fine, right? <laughs> Um, but but if you want to do exactly what Gigi's doing, just to learn exactly how she does it, that's all you'll need: some paper, a couple of pens, and I'm sure you have them lying in a drawer somewhere. And um, I've already seen this workshop. I've practiced some of these things. It's been really inspiring to me as well. And I know that you're going to get a huge amount out of it. But Gigi, let's let's look at some of your work. Would you mind showing us some some things? I'm, I will make myself small. Oh my God, I'm just gonna pick, so I have, so I've spent years just filling up books, you know. Let me see what it's in. Okay, so, so a little bit more advanced, but I started doing a lot of portraits. So I did, I did Inktober for the first time this past October, and I started uh, doing a lot of portraits. And you know, I've never really made such multicolored portraits before with a ballpoint pen. And honestly, I just go to the dollar store and I pick out, you know, pick out a bunch of pens. and. I, I mix and match a lot of sets just to see what works because uh, browns and blues look different from every every company. Here's another one. So it's been a lot of... Uh, but I want to re-emphasize what is obvious but may not be, which is ballpoint pens. That's what these are. These are just pens. regular ballpoint pens that anybody can buy. It's not. It's nothing more than that, which is so spectacular. Yeah, yeah for me, ballpoint pen has been the, the way that I relax. You know, you don't need a sharpener, you don't need anything else but the pen. And I have found myself, especially when I took on October this past, uh, this you know, this past October, I really wanted to, I just wanted to have fun. You know, I know I was asked a few questions about the archival properties of ballpoint pen, and honestly, sometimes I just, it's one of the few things that I, I really do it for myself. You know, I'm a painter, I make all these, you know, I make all these elaborate paintings, but Having something like this, which feels very intimate to myself, has been very important. Because sometimes you just need to, you need to have something for yourself. Like I know that 
I don't know how many of you guys like work towards selling work, but sometimes it's really good to just have work that's your own. And I found that ballpoint pen has been my thing. It's been mine. Like I'd like to sell them, but I don't want to make it into a thing. And trying to sell work can bring a lot of extra pressure, I suppose. And I found that doing ballpoint pen has been my way of just like having fun for myself. Really. So, so it's almost like the medium because. It may or may not be archival because it's not traditional. It frees you up to just say, you know what, this couldn't possibly be a super serious piece of art that I'm going to sell, so therefore I can just be looser. Is that kind of what you're thinking, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to think. I mean, so much of what we do as artists is we try to survive. And some of that can just be very exhausting. And to have something and to pick anything, you know, to pick anything that can be your own is, is very, I think it's a really important thing. You know, okay, so I just wanted to get it off. So, so this is like a, an idea of like, I use two different colors. You know, I use like a light blue and I use some green to kind of work. So, you know, if we're doing, thinking about doing duo tones, you don't need to go, you know, black and blue. You can pick, you know, duo tones, like tone. You could pick like a blue and a green or, or a blue and a darker blue. Um, which is something like I really want to, I mean, the thing is, like, yes, this is a workshop, we're going to learn, but, like, finding finding all the different things that you can do with it is, like, very important, you know, especially once the students get the get the workshop, they can play it over again anyway. So they can right. kind of like, play with the ideas in different ways, you know? So Yeah, show some fun. merch. I mean, these are spectacular, so just, I, I can't get enough of them, keep showing this. <laughs> I want to show some of the birds too, you know. So, give me. So, how long do you spend on each of these drawings? Uh, not as long as you would think. The duotones only take me a couple of hours. The color ones take me about three, maybe less. Depends on my level of concentration that right, day. Right. But when I was making these, I was making one a day. I was, and if I didn't, I would do two a day. And also, I was so obsessed with it because I had never done Inktober, and I every year I would see everyone post it. Be super, super jealous, and and this year I was like, I'm going to do something really hard every single day. <laughs> but it gave me something to do, and it, it kept me, um, kept me really happy every day. You know, like I felt like, okay, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go work on this, and if I didn't finish it, I can finish it the next day and start another one. Um, I think in the end, I I ended up doing 28. <laughs> wow, wow! I was so exhausted. I started, I'll show you once that I started, and then I just got, I got exhausted. You so know, you, took, so are, you took three days off, huh, slacker? No, I, I stopped. Oh, you stopped. <laughs> ran out of steam. <laughs> I stopped. I mean, I did, I think I might have done 28 days straight, and then I stopped. I burned myself out. I was so exhausted from it. Because they were getting, these were probably near the end of the, 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 the month, and I was like, oh, let's do, let's do all the colors. So I also use a gel pen to highlight um, you know, the hair right. and the eyes. But this is all like um, brown, some yellow pen, some purple, and you know, it really is hard to get like all these very supernatural colors, but I tried, you know. And it just depends on how you kind of skirt your paper, your, your pen on the on the on the page. And I found that this is a um, Kansen mixed media book and this is like a heavier one. Uh, this is the heavier heavier paper and I found that having a little bit of tooth is super helpful. Like, I like Bristol, but having a little bit of tooth to kind of create a little something, a little bit of a, you know, just a little, right, right. A little roughness is really nice to kind of get different types of. Uh, yeah, and also, I, I also imagine like a little bit of um, lack of control because your thing is so controlled, but then when the way the pen responds to the paper must be a little bit of a, an unknown sometimes, right? Yeah, but also sort of learning, like I left all of this, you know, this is very looser. Also sort of knowing that, you know, this isn't paint, really. I mean, this is, this, let, let the pencil, let the, I mean, I have no problem with people who want to make super hyper-realistic things with, with every medium, right? But I also, bubble pen is its own thing, and I want to say that it's, and it's really easy to overwork it because you want it. To, and some people, and I have a tendency. Like I want to make something look like a thing, right? Or make it look more more realistic. But then I, I kind of give in to the fact that you can just do these little patch marks with a face. Right. You know, like give into it. You don't have. It doesn't. It's not going to be. 
like I don't I'm not a hyper realistic painter like I, I make realistic like work but I don't feel like oh yeah this might have been my last one this one was really hard so <laughs> I ended up starting another one and I gave up and then I, I never out. <laughs> I mean they all look incredibly hard but uh, were there times when you were like Ugh, stupid ballpoint pens why am I working with them oh never. never no I never had that feeling my only my only thing is trying out the different um, brands has been more interesting right. oh here's a lot here and then and then I started doing really hyper I mean, like on. elaborate ballpoint pen drawings that's, uh, that's nuts this one was really fun but this is gonna be this is like a, a, a plan for a, a painting that I'm a working plan on. for a painting really yeah yeah this is gonna be it's gonna be a it's a 24 by uh, 36 uh, commission it's gonna be big so I I started the painting and I keep and I and I think I might make it look more like this and you know, I started the painting it didn't look quite like this sometimes you know I mean it, sometimes I think drawings are so much more magical than paintings depending on you know so you know I was quarantined with cats so for a little while a lot of cats in my life Gorgeous. <laughs> so they're so you know giving into the fact that you can kind of make looser looser right. things you know and and it's okay to kind of like you can have parts that are a little bit more realistic and really play like you can have so many different ways that you can play around with what you can do with lines, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I, I mean I, I'm also struck by I'm also struck by how much color there is inside of the color. So, you know, like even looking at like that shadow on the toilet paper, the fact that there's clearly like magentas and greens oh, yeah, and blue. stuff like that, and even the cat's fur just it has like s layers and layers of color, but yet it doesn't feel heavy and overworked. It feels sort of like the way it should. Yeah, and that's, I think that's something that. I honestly feel like I know I, I'm on, on a lot of I'm on some ballpoint pen forums and something that I think it is really important to just it's a drawing tool it's not paint you know right. and I think my biggest thing something that I think that I think everybody should also like think about is that when they get different types of ballpoint pens from different companies like like the more expensive companies they have more pigment in them and they won't blot up like sometimes when you use a pen it blots up it creates this little ball of ink the cheaper ones do that but sometimes the cheaper ones are really great because like i have this really cheap set and you can get this blue and it's super pale because there's not a lot of pigment in it and i love that you know so so it, it's like playing around with but it does blot up and it's, it's okay. also the feeling of i mean that fur feels like fur you know it's like your hair feels like hair it's like there's so much texture because I mean, you think of a ballpoint pen as basically laying down one color of ink. It's not, you know, you can press harder and lighter, and that changes the effect. But I feel like you're getting so many effects from it. And that's one of the things that I think you are showing us in the workshop, which is how, with a single colored pen, you can get such a broad range of effects. Can you show us something that's monochromatic and just give us a sense of that? Because, because I think that that's, that is truly... The technique, and, and I think it will be interesting to see how we're going to learn that because. Um, oh, did I a different book. Did, did I throw I the book? Yeah. Uh, endless number of books. Um, oh yeah, here's a. Well, this is. Uh, let me see. This one is almost completely monochromatic. Almost completely modern. This is pink, pink pen. Right. But I used. Um, I might have used a darker pink pen to do the to do the shadows, you know. Right. Yeah, and this one also, you know, you just I let it be ballpoint pen. I just let it be what it is, and it's okay. I like to learn to learn to where to be light-handed. Right. You know, is very important as an artist in general. Like I tend to be a very heavy-handed painter, and there have been times where I've told myself it's okay to leave whole parts looser because everyone will be looking at the realistic parts and then kind of scanning the rest of it anyway, you know, and as a, and what I like about drawing in general is that it allows me to kind of, like, I'm much more of a natural drawer than I'm a painter. I labor over painting. I labor over it and it's exhausting for me. Like I never feel like I ever finish anything. That's because I, I learned how to paint later than I did learn how to draw. And I do drawings for almost every one of my paintings beforehand, just because I like, I like to maintain I like to look back at my drawings to maintain that looseness for the painting. Otherwise, everything will just be, I'll be constantly trying to make something look realistic when it really doesn't have to be. 
right. you know, because it's painting. I mean, we're artists. We're not like, I mean, I, as I said, I love, I love, I'm amazed by hyper-realist painters, but I myself have accepted the fact that I'm not that kind of artist. If you say yeah. so, but I, I think most of us would disagree with that because you're clearly you're, creating, you're rendering photographic effect, near photographic effects with what you're doing. So another one. So I kind of just let, you know, just kind of let this be what it is, you know. This part. But if uh, we want to look at birds, we'll look at birds. Yeah, let's look at some birds because we're going to be drawing birds. Some of you are saying like, oh my God, is this just a commercial? Yes, it is a commercial. Sorry, guys. It's an amazing commercial for an amazing workshop, and we're going to be looking at some more GG stuff, and then we're all going to draw it together. Um, so, uh, all right, we should draw it together. <laughs> yeah, but here, so, here's, so, a, here's a ballpoint pen. One, I put a little bit of wash behind it, but we can draw together. Yeah, you know? no, show us a few. Show us a few more. Show us a few more because we can. We can always draw any time, but the opportunity to hang out with you and to learn about your stuff is just amazing. Better. Small, it's a small now this one. this this did did this become a painting or is it or or did you do something similar with similar? Oh uh, no, I've done some similar ones. Yeah, this, is, this that, has never been a painting. You know, so beautiful. I mean, all those greens. I mean, again, is that dozens of different green pens or is it a small number that are used in yeah, ways to create yeah, new colors? A few. I used a few. You know, I mean, I just kind of have them all in my lap and I see what works. You know. And let's see. Uh, show you one more. You know, so I think everybody wants to draw, right? Everyone wants to hang out and make art. <laughs> we do, we do. Um, those are just—I mean, every one of them is extraordinary. And I don't think—I don't think if you saw a picture of that, you would ever assume that um, that that's what this is. That this is both pen. All right. So, Gigi, um, tell us. Let's let's start working. Um, so the idea is, for those of you who are anxious to start working, grab one or more ballpoint pens, grab some photo reference. I will be using this. Let me come back up here. Sorry. And I don't have an extra camera here. I wish I did. I know. I think we're going to have to wait and see you when you. Um, we're going to wait and see you when you're when you're done, right? Yeah. Maybe you can show us the various times. I mean, we're going to work relatively quickly, but um, and I so grab some photo references. I said, uh, where's my picture of my bird? I think I'm gonna. Well, my friend started sending me pictures of her chickens, so I've been oh. drawing chickens. That is so great. <laughs> so I want to work on that. You know. All right. So here is my here's here's this uh, bird. We will put it aside, but I will bring it back in a second. Later. I switch to my other point of view. Um, okay, so how should we do this? What I would love to do also to, is to talk to you a little bit about how we can possibly learn to do some of the things you're doing in, in a workshop. So let's just talk about that while we're drawing, but let's, let's move to, I'm gonna move to my workshop thing, and uh, I'm gonna do this. And this. So, all right, so now we're little faces in the corner. We can see my sketchbook um, and I mean, honestly, this is humbling because now, of course, I'm going to make some horrible mess on the page after looking at all these things of Gigi's, but so be it. Um, it is it is humbling. So, all right, Gigi, start drawing. doesn't look like you're drawing. Oh, yeah. What, what are you going to draw? What are you going to draw? <laughs> So what are you going to, what are you drawing? And I'm going to be drawing with these mini pens. So I got these ink join minis. They're pretty good. I mean, what I liked about them is I got 10 of them for a dollar. No, 10 of them for $10. Okay. Do you have, you've, have you used this? I'm sure you have, right? Paper make ink joys. Yeah, I had the, I just bought like a giant pack of them. Yeah. They were super on sale at Staples. And I think I ended up getting a, tw it came with like a double pack. You know, let me see. Were there sure. more than 10 colors? Oh, geez, there were so many of everything. I think I might have, I think I ended up buying two boxes of them because I'm weird. Uh, I have so many, I have so much, I have a lot of stuff in here, so I don't, you know, uh, just like yours. So, 
So, um, ask you. tell 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 us a bit about like what we're going to be doing in this workshop. Like, how's it going to how's it going to work? How are we going to learn this this stuff? Because I'm clearly in desperate need of learning it. I'm far from it. far from it. Well, we're going to start off with learning some techniques. You know, we're going to learn how to make marks, and, and I think it's really important to to practice just like learning how you make marks, you know, with a ballpoint pen and figuring out how the different ways, like what works for you, you know, and playing around with, also, I think it's also important that maybe in prep is like to learn like maybe what brand you like, you know, like some, I have a lot of medium point, one, medium point pens, but there are also some fine point pens and just sort of learning what will work for you beforehand maybe. Um, or you just want to go in there like blind. Also, that's also kind of fun. Going in there blind is also very interesting. Um, I also kind of like to, to emphasize the idea that like it's it's pen and it's permanent, and you can kind of correct it, but it's not. It's not that big of a deal if you kind of mess up a little bit with it, mm -hmm. you know. And I kind of I kind of like the it's kind of kind of like the pen that way, you know, just to kind of like let it be, letting it be what it is, and. Yeah, and I also I just I really enjoy the idea of like making something that everybody has, and maybe that's probably what I mean. I used to kind of sit around and make a lot of doodles in school. Like I didn't paint. Admittedly, I, I was a good student but didn't like school, and I spent a lot of time drawing in my tech. So I spent a lot of time as a kid learning how to cross hatch. Uh, because cross hatching is basically doodling. A little it's, bit. It's doodling, you know? doodling sophisticated cousin. I mean, my thinking was always that I'm like, well, I have the books. I'll learn this later. So I'll just do this for now. And I went to art school. Like, it's not even like my high school was an art school, so I did that anyway. I, and I think that maybe they kind of expected that, that I wouldn't be paying attention anyway. But it's hard to say. I was a straight A student, though. You know. Would they? Have, <laughs> do you think they would have frowned on ballpoint pens in art school? I, uh, I don't know. I mean, my art school, my high school was an art school. I went to school in college to be a traditional animator, and I didn't end up doing that. So, oh really? Yeah, I didn't. That wasn't really a, a thing that happened. I ended up leaving school and wanted to become a painter because that was hyper profitable. <laughs> it's a, a great business decision. <laughs> oh, 21 year old Gigi didn't know what was going on. Right. Well, you're still. Uh, you're still we're still living with our decisions. Oh my God! I re you know what's funny? It's that I, what's kind of nice is that the older I get, the more I feel like I made the right decision. Even yeah, though, good. I think because when you're when you're really young and you're out of college, it doesn't um, making a decision always feels very like you make a decision, but you have like no idea what's going to happen anyway. You know? Right. I mean, I was. I mean, what's really strange is that I was such a uh, nerdy kid. And in a lot of ways, becoming an artist was probably the most reckless thing I probably could have done, you know? <laughs> did you, how, how did your family feel about you being an artist? Um, I, I think for a long time they thought I was going to just do something else. But you know what it was? I think they, when you, when you pick something really young and you really commit to it, magic can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that... Maybe also because I'm really, really lucky and I grew up in New York City and there was a little bit more opportunity. Things happened all the time to me as a child, as being an artist, you know, like, because there's just more, there's just more that happens in New York City, you know? Um, we were immigrants and we, you know, I grew up here as like a Chinese immigrant and my parents expected us all to have normal jobs. My sister ended up working for the government, you know, like all those things. But I think the more they saw all the weird stuff that's happening to me, like awards or I would get to travel, I think they really kind of, they had to stop judging what it is. Right. They kind of accept the fact that like, oh, I think she's doing okay. You know, like, the, like and I also, I also sort of had this very, and I still kind of have this very naive thought that like, well, the money will come. I'll figure this one out, you know? Because I don't think that, um, Doing something out of fear isn't always helpful. 
like I've taken random jobs thinking that it would be super helpful, thinking that I was supposed to take these jobs, right. like random sales girls jobs or office jobs. And in the end, it was just sort of, it wasn't very helpful, you know, because mm -hmm. I, made, I made those choices out of fear. That's good. Uh, yeah. Also, and also it wasted your time. Well, you realize, I mean, you realize pretty, I, I realized pretty quickly afterwards. I mean, I was selling memberships to like an art magazine for a little while. I did that for a few weeks and I was not, I mean, first of all, sales are really hard. <laughs> They're a lot harder than it seems. Like just because you you can talk to people doesn't mean you're going to make a sale. And I realized that giving away all of your energy to something that you don't care that much about is like, Mm -hmm. you know and uh, I thought it was called maturity there was a lot of I haven't I mean honestly like these are all it's all terrible advice guys like you need to get a job, get a job. <laughs> like I was I, I, <laughs> like don't like I always tell people like don't do what I did because I went ever into everything like completely blind you know mm -hmm. not not knowing what was gonna happen and not thinking that maybe something bad could happen but I was also super young when I entered the world. Well, I was 24 and didn't think, I thought, oh, I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I can like go and sell work. And I didn't sell work for a long time. <laughs> you know, like a super long, like in a way that like, I can't even believe that I stayed in the business. It's a difficult world to progress in, the fine art world. Because you weren't an illustrator, you were a fine artist and that, is something where you know it's a it's a small clicky world, right? That you I imagine you have to spend a lot of time negotiating. I mean, it, it can be, but I I didn't grow up like that, you know, because I went to school to be a commercial artist. I was used to being a collaborator, mm -hmm. and also I had worked as an assistant, and I still do with artists. So I'm used to working with people. I I wasn't super crazy about being in the art world filled with people who went to very fancy schools who you know, had a pedigree and I didn't have a pedigree, you know, and I went into this completely, you know, on my own terms trying to figure stuff out thinking like, I'm good at this. I can talk to people. Let's see what happens. And that when you do that, when you're really young, it's, I don't know, like, I don't even know how I like how I stayed in it because it was super weird and I didn't go to Yale or Harvard. I didn't, I didn't even get a fine art degree. You know, and uh, it can be clicky if you want it to be clicky, but I'm not that way. Like I found a bunch of people that who, even if they went to really great schools, I just weren't like that. And I'm not like that, you know, but I also like, I totally get that. I get like how if you go to a really fancy school, maybe you want to only hang out with people in fancy schools or, but I also like don't, you know, I don't want to judge that either. But I think know? it's also a business decision when it comes to artists, because I think in a lot of cases, the connections that you make in art school can often define your career as an artist over the long term. You know, I think that's why it's difficult for people who didn't go to art school to break in. It's not necessarily that they didn't get training or that they don't have ability. It's that they don't necessarily have those same connections that you get from, you know, going to school with people, having professors, you know, and all those kinds of things that, that you know, like any business, like any industry, um, it hinges a lot on who you know. Yeah. I think that, I think from what happened with me, it was that I just went in blind and just started talking to people. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there is something to say about just making a lot of work. Like, and I give this advice, like guys, I'm almost like, I'm actually almost 40 years old. And like, I've been like showing and doing stuff since my, I've been showing since I was 23. I'm really lucky, but that's because, oh, first of all, guys, the advantage is I grew up here. Like, I grew up in New York City. It isn't like, it's much more challenging if you didn't grow up in a bigger city. Like, so I'm not even going to say like, oh, you know, everything happened to me and it was super accidental. It's like, no, well, I, I grew up here. You know, mm -hmm. I'm actually really, I'm very used to being here. I didn't grow up in a fancy neighborhood and a fancy family, but I am used to how weirdly paced New York City is. And so I'm going to just sort of like, put that in but in terms of I really wanted to do this and because I had absolutely no reference for maybe it not working out <laughs> I I went in blindsided and I walked and also when I was in my 20s 
galleries are much more open to having people walk in and talk to them. So over 10 years ago, you could walk into a gallery in Brooklyn and talk to people. You could walk into any rando gallery, except in Chelsea, except in the fancy neighborhoods, and you can actually talk to them. And sometimes they, and almost they, they all answered my emails back in my 20s. It's not like that now. It's very different, but, but you also you also were bold, and you took it. You took you you know took a, took a stand. You believed in yourself enough to to actually make that kind of decision, those kinds of connections, which is which is again part of it. It's like don't you think that your faith in yourself helped you to sell sell what you are to people who I mean, didn't I was naive. I mean, that having naive. faith and being kind of naive when you're 23 is like you know like it's maybe exactly the same thing. I figured when I was 23, I was like, I'm good at stuff, right? I'll just talk. And and sometimes I would have studio visits. And I remember this, having studio visits when I was in my early 20s. And they would walk in and be like, what else do you have? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I would somehow get people to come into the studio, and I wouldn't have that much work. And, and I thought, how come I'm not showing with them? And then, hmm. you know, it wasn't until years later that it's like, oh, right, 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 right. Like, I was making a lot of work. It was all work on paper, but um, it took a lot of time for me to realize why certain things didn't work out. You know, like timing is everything. And also, like for any of you guys who want to show at galleries, it's really important to have a big body of work and have an identity for yourself before you stop shopping the work around. Like it really is about. I like it's a, it's a, it's a job, right? Like you don't go and apply for a job that you're not qualified for. Like if you don't have enough work experience, if like a job description said, I need five years worth of experience as a nurse, we don't go and apply for it right out of school, right? Like it's the same thing. Like if you don't have a body of work, it's not a wonder why you can't show, right? Like it's not, like for me that, that's something that it's taken me a long time to realize. Um, but also like growing up in it and actually I decided that I just needed to like stick with it. You know, and I stuck with it somehow. But I would add to that, and I would say, and I know this as a writer as well, like there are a lot of people who want to be writers, but they don't necessarily want to write. You know, and I think that's true of artists as well. There are people who, like, they like the idea of being an artist. They like the idea of making money as an artist. They like the idea of having that life. But at the, S, at the, at the you know, the main point of it all is, you have to want to make art. You have to do that. And it's surprising how many people kind of miss that. I, I remember being in a creative writing class in college, and the teacher said something like, okay, I'm going to expect, I need you to hand in a story every week. And somebody groaned from the back room, every week? I was like, I was like <laughs> well, what the hell are you doing here? Like, yeah. yeah. You have to write something every week. Like, you, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be, uh, like a pain. It's not like I'm asking you to write like a physics paper every week. It's like this is what you're supposed to want to do. And I think that that's the, a lot of the problem is like the 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 label and the idea of of being in that position can overwhelm you. So so if you if a gallerist comes in and sees you haven't really made that much work, I think in or part they want <laughs> yeah they want to see more of your work, but they also want to know that you actually really want to do this and believe in it and you're doing everything you can to to get there you know yeah and also sort of like um after spending a lot of time doing this i realized that like rejections are not actually rejections you know like a lot of things are super arbitrary like um sure okay so when i was in my 20s i was getting rejected from stuff but but in my 30s i'm like well well it's not really a rejection if there's like an actual like a lot of things like Everything is arbitrary in the art world. Mm -hmm. Sales are arbitrary. Why people get shown is pretty arbitrary. Subjective, you know, like, subjective, and based yeah, on based yeah, on what they like, think might happen, or just or or super random, or just right. random. You happen to walk in at the right time, and they happen to be open to talking to you. Like right. honestly, I mean, if when I was in my twenties, if I didn't do that, it would have been different. But like, and and now honestly, I don't really do that very often. I don't. Maybe also because I'm a little bit more timid about it. And I also sort of understand that sometimes people don't want to be bothered. They don't have time to go and look at your stuff. And, um, and if you, and you know, it's funny when you're, especially because I've done art fairs, artists, like if you're, if you're someone with a booth 
in your gallery, like they don't really want a bunch of people walking in. Like people, like meaning that a lot of galleries are there that they want to make sales. They don't always have the time to kind of sit and chit chat with all the people who walk in, like right. who just want to show you, show them the work. And, and that's also something that I've become a lot more sensitive to because it is like, it's their job, you know? And I've had, um, I've had art booths and I've paid for like a couple of art booths and I've like shown it super fine art fair. And I've had a lot of random artists come in and just ask me a bunch of questions. And I kind of go like, they're like, how did you do? How are you doing this? And how, you know, like, how are you making any sales? And it's like, well, um, You're not there to I'm be a career here. coach. I'm here to make a sale. Right. And, and I used to kind of think that was rude if somebody did that at a booth. And now I'm like, oh, I'm doing this. Like, I just paid money to be here. Mm. Like, galleries are paying rent to be in their space. So their snobbiness is not always sort of like, maybe it's not always so nice, but I, I kind of get it now. That a, I think that's a good point because it's, it's a cliche of the art world that you go to Chelsea and there's like some, you know, 24 year old, well-groomed young woman with a, an art history degree sitting behind a, a white desk and, you know, yeah. barely looks at you when you walk in. But if you think about it, it's like, well, you're, you're not there to buy anything. You're, you're not really a customer. You just, a person who is getting, you know, the advantage of looking at this stuff for free, but there, it is a business and it is a, an industry. Um, and you wouldn't walk into some yeah. other random office. You wouldn't walk into like a law office and like expect to like learn about law or see yeah. some free, see some free testimonials or depositions. Or something. Sure, yeah, some is, are super open to talking. Some, some are not. Like, but yeah, I mean, it's a funny thing like that. But those are all things that I didn't know. You know, like, I don't know. So let's go back to talking about ballpoint pens. So there seems to be still a certain amount of consideration um, about concern about what kind of pens we're using and so forth. Tell me why it really, why, why doesn't it matter that much? Or what are you, what is it that you're looking for? Because um, like when you go and find it, is, is it that you go through dozens and they all suck? Or is it that basically most of them are fine? What is your attitude towards the picking the pens that you're using? It depends on what you're trying to do. Like, as I said, I use the cheaper ones to do like light grounds, but I also, you should find a, you should find the pens that don't pull as much. Like the ones meaning that create that weird little like ink mark, you know? So, that so it's like happen. they get blobby? And... Yeah, yeah. So I, I like the, the brand, the big brands, like I have Bix, but I yeah. find that sometimes they deposit too much ink. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes I and I do layer with what I do, and I do tend to do a lot of. Um, sometimes I'll use the cheaper pens and do an underneath color overlay, you know, and then I'll use like the more highly pigmented ones. And I think just like any other art supply, is that the more the slightly more, and none of them are expensive. Like none of these pens are not even like a whole set of big is that expensive, right? Um, is like the the more slightly more that you pay, like the pigment is going to be higher. You know, maybe even the archival qualities of it will be higher. Not not that I know too much about the archival qualities. Of I was going to say, are there are there actually like super expensive ballpoint pens? I've never. Heard of uh, I mean, I imagine you can buy fancy ones with like gold things that you know executives carry in their pockets. But when it comes to the actual quality of the pen, it seems like there's kind of a threshold. I kind of doubt that. I mean, I d I mean. Those are those really nice ones. Just have really nice, like the bodies, cases. right, right. The, the body. bodies are nice. I mean, yeah. I would say that if you're buying, I mean, I can't imagine they're like so much better. It just depends on how they flow. If you're if you're looking, I would say look better for for flow, the flow of the pen, than than for actual like. I would say tr like like I used to do. I do a lot of like color pencil drawings too, and sometimes I have Crayolas mm. because they create. A, they have like very little pigment and they can create a very like they're actually and they're incredibly consistent too because they're an old company like they don't have a lot of pigment in their pencil but you can deposit a really good layer of like a flat color that's super consistent that you can draw over with something nice that's you know and i would say think of it think of the ballpoint pen the same way i thought it was interesting that you said to me once that it's really impossible to find a yellow ballpoint pen that like you can get kind of any color but you can't really find yellow we found some from flying tiger but i don't think they sell them anymore this is the first time i found one 
And I found that also I went to some random dollar stores recently and I found a bunch, but a lot of them are not very yellow. They're a little bit more orange. Um, it's so weird though to like not have a, one of the primaries available to you. It just seems like so kind of basic, but I guess it's like a, I, I wonder if it's a chemical thing or if it's just that yellow, not many people buy yellow ballpoint pens because you can't really use them for much because they're so white. I don't, know. I don't think that people would need them. I mean, people use black and blue pens to draw and to write. Like right. most people are not buying ballpoint pens to draw with. Right. You know, um, yeah. I mean, even buying a big multi pack. If you're like a, I guess if you're not drawing with it, you're not thinking too much about it. You know, you're buying a giant pack of black pens. Right. You know. All right, I'm not getting any happier with my drawing, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> It's, it's becoming more depressing um, because I haven't, I haven't really taken your workshop. So I'm going to stop and then we're going to return to talking about, yeah, see, mine just, it just, I don't know. He just got more and more. I think you just, you, I think you, I think what you did was that just like, I, I think you used way too much color all at once. That could be because I got started yeah. getting impatient. So I was layering on more color and more color and more color. Like the dark should go last, and I think that also you probably don't need the black. I don't even really use black in what I do. I use purple as like my darks, you know. I, I, I think yeah. I mean, I'm, on this, uh, I use I use it for the eye, you know. Yeah. yeah. You also left a lot I of the page empty because I because I did this other one the other day and. Yeah, yeah. It's also just um, a lighter colors, you know. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't kind of give into the black, so yeah. I got a lot to learn. I got a lot to learn with it. It's just. I mean, it's just not something. I also feel like, like I'm trying to draw like you, and that's part of the problem too. Are you gonna work away from that? You know. <laughs> I know. I know. If it was, if it, I think it may be too neat. Like I like splattering ink everywhere, so the point that might be too controlled. Splatter ink. Splatter ink and then do color. That's true. Right? I, I know. I know. It's true. I need. I, I think I just. I'm. I think what happens when you learn a new medium, particularly if you learn a new medium because you like a particular artist's work, that you end up like working within the confines of what they do, and it takes a long time for you to say, you know what, I've got to hold on to some of these things and throw away most of the rest of them and, and bring in me and my stuff. And I think, I think that's what's interesting about doing this workshop, about doing any of the workshops that we've done, is it's like, it's like a spice that you put into your soup but if you put in too much of that one spice, it overwhelms the taste, and you know it's like it, and it also needs to all like boil down, like it needs to all marinate and become who you are. I'm sure you've had that experience too, right? Well, I think that's more like a, if we're going to use the spice metaphor, it's more like learning about a new spice and getting really excited about it and wanting to use it in everything, but not, you know what I mean? And then you have to be like, no, 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 right. you only need a little bit, or maybe you don't need it here, you know, like and. That's something that, I mean, even like the way I loosen up what I do, I only do that because I've been drawing for a long time. Right. And I've also been doing ball and pen for so long to the point where I'm like, I know in my head what I want to leave behind. And I think with your drawing, it's like, like you want, like I, you want to, you want to make it look like the drawing, look like the piece, but maybe you would just need to come up with like how to make it like an idea of it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's looser and messier, and that's that's more. And maybe that's what like what you could be doing with this instead. I know, I know. I I'm also going through a period right now where, for the last few months, I've just been working in tones, no color. Mm -hmm. And then literally like four days ago, I was like color, and now my reaction to color is like color, 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 and like no, like completely out of control. No, like discipline at all. So, I need to yeah. dial it back. I need to, and the, and it's funny because when I first started to draw, you know, twenty years ago, I started with one pen, and then I added a tone of gray, and then I added another tone of gray, and then eventually I put in some color, one color, and then it took me like two or three years to really get to the point where I was like, okay, I'm ready to actually work with a, a palette of watercolors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. when I look at your stuff and I think, okay, but you, when you have all these monochrome things, 
you're still being really controlled. You're working in color, but you're really only working in one or two colors. And so it's, I think you need to set some boundaries. And I think when you start to jump into a new thing, you're like, I want to do everything. And you grab a bunch of it. You're like a, you're like a four-year-old in, in a toy store, you know, you just like. Well, because you got the whole pack and they're so cheap, you know, like it's such a, like, it's so like you want to, but maybe if you, I think for your hummingbird, you could have probably used a green and a blue. Right. Right, you know, like, and then the whole thing with, with green and then added the blue. Yeah. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. <laughs> I'll do it again. Maybe after <laughs> after next weekend. So one of the things that we're going to be doing in this workshop, and I, I think it's it's an amazing new thing that we've done recently, which is this business of getting giving feedback to people. And I think I wanted to talk to you a bit about it because it's it's not... Well, in some ways, it's kind of like a crit in art school. So a crit in art school isn't, here's my drawing, is it any good? But it's more a group conversation around one person's piece. So you put a piece up there, or maybe multiple pieces, right? You might have a class full of people. You put your stuff up. And then you're having a conversation in more general terms rather than, you should have made this bigger, or you should have put in more red, or, or I, I would do this. And it's more of an opportunity to discuss, I think in this case, the whole essence of this workshop, which is how do we draw birds and how do we draw them with ballpoint pens? And so the way that the feedback session works is people who come to the workshop on Saturday, that afternoon and evening work on their pieces if they haven't finished them during the workshop. And then they email them in. And then we take all of the different things that people have emailed and we say to them, we ask them when they send in their email, tell us what you want to talk about in regard to this particular drawing. So don't just send a drawing and go like, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. You say, I was having a problem with using too many colors or my line was too heavy or I didn't get the eye right or I don't, it doesn't feel like feathers. Whatever it is, these are the categories of things. And then we take everybody who had that issue because basically everybody's going to have similar issues. And we take them and group them together, and then we ask you, how would you deal with this larger problem? So it's not one-on-one, -on -one, here's me dissecting your thing, but it's really more, I think, more useful because we'll talk about bigger issues. And I think that way everybody learns from what everybody else has submitted, right? Because I don't really care about overhearing your conversation. I want to know bigger things. What do you think about that approach? Does it make sense to you? Well, I think it's a it's a really good approach because I think everyone's gonna have their own issues with the medium, you know. Like I think that sure you're learning techniques, like you can watch me do it, but how do you make it better for yourself? Like and right. also sort of appropriate for yourself. Like as I said, like everybody, everybody's gonna be making. We're all working from the same images, but everyone's gonna be doing it differently. And I don't think it's fair to compare. But they're like first of all, it's not great to compare it to each other. It's, it's useless. It's really no. It's there's yeah. no use because it's like the fact that your drawing is different or better than mine doesn't really help me. I mean, I'm yeah. just like I have work to do. So I'm glad to yeah. I'm glad for you to give me a couple pieces of advice like you just did. But ultimately, I have to incorporate. I have to work. I have to keep doing it. Make it yeah. mine. Yeah. Yeah, like so, anything else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think another cool thing about it is it gives us another couple hours to hang out and talk. You know, to talk about this stuff that we all find really interesting. So, so the workshop is going to be two hours, and then the following day on Sunday, we'll get together again. We'll spend another ninety minutes or something like that, using these drawings that people submitted as a springboard. So, I don't know. I mean, some of you have def have been in this, um, have been in these workshops with the feedback. I see Renata says that she she liked it. You know, and I think I think it's from my experience, I learned more and it also stuck with me for longer because I keep thinking back to other workshops we've had and I think back oh yeah he said this and that or oh yes I, I saw that approach or oh that person did a thing that I thought was interesting I wonder if I could do that so it's like it's but it takes time you don't instantly get these things they're just like again more stuff that's going into the big kettle of soup yeah of course like anything else and also as I said like it's a video you can go back and look and at it again it. And, like, right. Let's slow it down, check out little parts of it also. And, and also the, the feedback will, session will be interesting just because everyone will have a very different issue that they have they want right. to approach. And if you're watching the feedback, maybe you, you had that issue too, but you didn't know how to articulate it. That's a good you know? point also. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Or you didn't really realize that that's what you were doing. 
You know, you yeah. go, oh, that's what the, was going on. So definitely, that'll be interesting. Listen, this has been great. We've um, so <laughs> Ann Shavers asked if we'll all work from the same image. Yes, you will. You will work from two. We're going to do two yeah. demos, two different demos. One just black and white. One black and blue and white. Um, and we will give you the pictures in advance. We will give you the supply list. You will know about the brands of pens. All that stuff you'll find out. Um, you have not much time left. You have less than a week to sign up. So if I were you, I would get on it. And uh, a lot of people have signed up, and we, um, you know, this is just a lot of excitement around having Gigi join us. So many people want to be like Gigi, and this is the, the chance to be to be like her. And um, you know, she, we will learn and um, improve our skills, and and also I think just. Uh, approach a lot of issues that may have nothing to do with ballpoints and nothing to do with birds, but have to do with being a creative person, expressing your voice. I think what's so fascinating about what Gigi does is that she's using birds as metaphors for other things. So it's not just like nature drawings. She's telling these incredible stories about human relationships, you know, about our hopes and fears, about, about the things that really matter in our hearts. And she's using birds as a way of, of getting there. So you, you come to a piece of art and you think it's one thing and then you realize that it's actually something completely different. And that I think is a way of communicating really deeply with ourselves, you know, through the medium of art, which is really important and beautiful and also subjective. We can all bring different bits to the story. So I really love your art, Gigi. I feel like I've learned a lot about it on technical levels, but also on human levels. It's really, really nice. So, all right, so everybody go through those drawers, pull out all those horrible old ballpoint pens, scrub them down, and get ready for the workshop. All right, Gigi, thanks again for joining us. Any f parting words of wisdom? Oh, gosh, no, I'm really excited to be doing my first workshop with Sketchbook School. I mean, I did, I did those talks with you guys. At, at SketchCon. SketchCon, you were at SketchCon, absolutely oh, amazing there. Yeah, and I, went, and I was like working with Artist Network to, to work with, I'm so happy that you guys asked me to work with you guys, like for real, like this is really cool. No, 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 we've, we've always wanted to, and, and this is an opportunity I think for you to be, you know, the star center stage and to give a really deep, meaningful experience to people who want. I mean, so if you want to be even remotely like Gigi, I know I do, I'm growing my hair out and uh, I'm, I'm ready to do it, so, all right, all right, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, Gigi. Thank you guys for joining me. I'll see you next week, and we'll see Gigi the, f the week after that, or the weekend after that. Um, what is it again? What's the date? Uh, it's the 18th, and the feedback session is on the 19th. Exactly.